Welcome to the High Rise Podcast, presented by Headset, the leading data and analytics company for the cannabis industry. So Emily, I'd like to imagine that if Clerks was released today, you know the movie from the 90s, of course you know Clerks. Um, I, I'm sure most of our listeners know Clerks. Uh, it's it's an iconic movie, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but do you remember, it takes place in a convenience store, right? And the yeah. whole thing is about Clerks in a convenience store in New Jersey, and you've got Jay and Silent Bob, you know, hanging out outside, doing their thing. Mm -hmm. I'd love to think if that was made today, which I know technically it is still being made today, because I think they're on like Clerks 3, Clerks 4, maybe, which I haven't seen. Uh, but if it was made today from the start, I'd have to believe that it would take place in a cannabis retail, in a dispensary, because it, it's just so perfect for them and for their brand. I mean, I mean, Jay and Silent Bob, I think they even have their own branded products, uh, not in New Jersey. I think it's in California, but I think that makes a lot of sense. And, and I bring it up because I do want to spend some time on New Jersey today. Yeah, I think the only difference would be that there would not be so much hanging around because from what I saw last week on my tour of New Jersey, the bud tenders are very busy. So <laughs> <laughs> not just sitting there talking, nobody's no. coming in the store. <laughs> no, in fact, everybody is going in the store. So very uh, vibrant market. That is a good point. I guess the, the whole premise wouldn't work, right? Because it's all just these philosophical discussions because they have absolutely nothing to do. But a, disp <laughs> a dispensary is, is a lot busier. Um, and yeah, hopefully about to get even busier. So first thing I want to touch on, uh, there's just been a lot of New Jersey news, right? So the first one is that the, the Cannabis Regulatory Commission has amended its rules to prioritize cannabis licensing for social equity applicants. And so when, you know, social equity, we talk about it a lot. When, when New Jersey is talking about social equity applicants, that means those with prior uh, offense, cannabis offenses or living in economically disadvantaged areas, right? And so that was their social equity uh, criteria. And there's been a lot of pushback on that. And uh, they were going to prioritize, I think, these, um, these groups for a year originally is what, uh, what I think I, I read. But they've changed those rules. And so just a quick summary on, on what that looks like now is basically uh, for the first three months, they're going to still prioritize that group. And then they're going to, for the next three months, they're going to prioritize uh, diversely owned businesses. So mm -hmm. businesses that you know are owned by women, minorities, disabled veterans. Uh, and, and all this is around the wholesale distributor and delivery licenses. And that's, mm -hmm. a, I think, a bit of clarity that, that is easily lost. And when I was doing a little research, mm -hmm. Um, that was a hard thing for me to track that this isn't necessarily a production, uh, the grows or retail, but more mm -hmm. of the, the wholesale distributing delivery. Um, and so this change came about because there was a lot of concern that, um, you know, the, this kind of secondary group, the, the, um, you know, those like that aren't necessarily the, as they define social equity. So don't have prior, you know, cannabis offenses or, or live in these disadvantaged areas, but are still just as like negatively impacted uh, by prohibition. Right. And mm -hmm. so uh, this way they can start to get, you know, access to the system a little bit sooner. Uh, I don't think it was a unanimous decision uh, with the group, but I, I do, I think personally, I think this is the right move. It kind of splits the difference and it seems to kind of expand the tent a little bit on these things. Um, but I want to, you know, talk to you about it. I know you were just there in New Jersey. Uh, you've mm -hmm. been close to New Jersey uh, for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, so what do you, what do you think about these changes? Are people talking about these changes? Are you hearing anything about it? We didn't, I didn't hear too much about it, but I was really focused on retail on this trip, just making sure I could get into the stores and see what the different operators were doing differently and, and also doing some site visits, frankly. I think um, anyone who follows us on LinkedIn has seen that we are interested in allocating capital into the state. And um, and so we, but we are, we are really kind of focused on that, that retail side, which makes sense. It is a, a side that is a it requires investment because you do have, you know, CapEx to get these things off the ground. Um, you know, I, I think it's a, I think it's great. I'm always glad when we, to your point, I like that, expand the tent and to give people priority in terms of getting these licenses done, as we know that, you know, New Jersey was pretty good about getting things open, but then there has been a bit of a lag in getting more of them going. And so there is still a pretty tight count on a number of uh, operators in the state who do have the, the full licenses. So expediting this and putting this group in a priority position, I think is a good idea. Um, and I did think it was interesting how they're kind of like 
kind of creating these different uh, period, these windows to get it done. Um, to your point about the types of licenses that this includes, which I, I also missed, um, you know, I think we've talked about this before where I think a little bit of me, like, I think they're doing that likely because those types of licenses require lower capex, like to build out a cultivation facility or a manufacturing facility or a retail location, hopefully you're containing costs on the retail, but on others, it can be quite expensive on the upfront and require financing. And unfortunately, yet again, we don't have any banking reform. And in fact, things are getting harder. We, you know, the, there was the MasterCard memo. And I do think that groups that fall into these um, cohorts of the equity, social equity, are unfortunately also underserved by banking. And so the ability to get lending or to get uh, various things around that is just not, it's not happening. So I feel like the regulators kind of went ahead and, and kind of bypassed that and said, we're going to focus on these license types. Now, I don't, I don't love that because yeah. I think there are equity people who have been able to procure funding. Like, for example, our friend Suzanne Nicholson, she on the podcast shared with us how difficult that was, but she got it done. And she has she was the first one to get a retail store open, um, Holistic Solutions. And I think that, you know, the regulator shouldn't step up and, and limit the opportunity around what types of license it is. But I guess that was maybe the thinking. I'm not I'm not really sure. Um, it's hard to get a window into the thinking on that. Yeah, it is. It is absolutely right. Hard to hard to get a window into thinking that, it, you know, some thoughts, maybe it's just less competitive in that space. You yeah. know, we, yeah, we think about production, we think about retail quite a bit. Um, and, you know, maybe more, more CapEx, but uh, yeah, less competitive, uh, you know, maybe it balances interest between, I don't know what exists for the, the other groups, the retail groups, but, you know, also the social e equity, um, you know, these types of social equity groups, but mm -hmm. uh, an interesting choice to kind of split it like that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, retail, and, and we'll get into some numbers, but I do feel like retail is certainly an underserved portion of the, of the market. And yes. I think, yeah, that has to do with the application process, but also, you know, just the, the blanket bans and the, like these New Jersey jurisdictions, like if, yes. if you remember, it was something like 70% of jurisdictions have banned cannabis. So yeah. All, yeah, we know, you know, they did that because if you didn't ban it, you couldn't later ban it. So they wanted to ban it and then they'll probably roll it out just like what we saw here in California. Now the state is much smaller. I happen to know because I drove all over it last week, but, um, and I couldn't have done if I'd gone from corner to corner, like I did last week, I couldn't have done that in California, but um, yeah, there is not enough retail. And by the way, I just did, speaking of retail, I do want to give a shout out to Alex at, um, Ascend in Montclair, <laughs> who is an active listener of the podcast. And I was happy to meet, um, him and see what he's done. Cause you know, a lot of these places were actually medical or not a lot, but some of them were medical and then pulled into the adult use market. And I always find that an interesting transition to hear about what that's like for, operators and those who are in the retail environment to see that shift and to, to navigate that shift. And one of the big things, I don't know if you remember this, Cy, but I was listening to the hearings when they were granting um, the adult use licenses to open. And one of the things that the, excuse me, the regulators were really focused on was making sure that there was enough product to continue to serve a medical market. And I know you have some really interesting data around this, but I think, um, it actually created some interesting stockpiling and maybe oversupplying on the back end, which is driving product into different form factors. I was hearing this from the operators in the market, like into distillate, which we've seen in, in Michigan too. Like distillate is getting really big because if you have a lot of flour, a lot of surplus organic material, and then you put it into those more finished good states, they, they can last longer. So interesting to see a market transition from medical to adult use and then to see what happens to the medical markets, but also how the regulators have these requirements that sometimes then become challenging on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to talk about production too, uh, in New Jersey. Uh, but first, um, you know, all these changes on the social equity side kind of come off of, uh, a Senate judiciary committee, a New Jersey Senate, uh, committee that happened in late June, um, where they they grilled the cannabis regulatory committee, and they they pointed out things like 
uh, favoring major cannabis operators, slow approval of applications, uh, hindering the industry with excessive bureaucracy. I don't know. Sounds like every market, personally, mm -hmm. when, I, when I think about it. not just limited to New Jersey. But, Same bureaucracy, different market, <laughs> different bureaucrats. <laughs> exactly. Um, they also uh, raised concerns about uh, Delta Eight products and the accessibility of of that to minors. Um, the the thing is, the regulatory committee I don't think could control the Delta Eight. They don't, you know, handle oh, licensing geez. for Delta Eight, right? Yeah. But they brought it up, right? So they're kind of throwing it, you know, into this this bucket. Uh, but another thing, uh, you know, besides you know all that, uh, the the social equity component where they called out, they've done little mm -hmm. to include uh, black and brown communities that were disproportionately affected. Uh, they also talked about pricing and mm -hmm. the, the extreme uh, pricing that that still exists. And it is uh, true when you look at the pricing, um, it's pretty high. Uh, and, you know, when you look at groups like Cure Leaf that sell in New Jersey and they sell in Oregon, in New Jersey, you know, roughly, you know, $60 will get you an eighth. Uh, and you compare that to Oregon, where you know roughly ten dollars will get you an eighth. Uh, you know, maybe ten is on the on the pretty low side. I mean, but but it is. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. It's not, right. Right. <laughs> ten dollar eighths, geez Louise. I mean, you know, I, I'm I'm speaking in extremes, uh, no, but I mean, but for sure, really like the twenty five to thirty, you know, somewhere. In yeah. There. Right. Right. So still pretty high. So they're pushing pushing that, and and um, you know, I think that the getting into you know, the illicit market problem, right? We always talk about, it. and obviously when you have prices that high, uh, that's going to be a problem. People are just going to stay uh, in the illicit market. And so mm -hmm. the, the committee did say that they want to convert consumers from illicit or informal purchases to the legal regulated market where products are tested. Okay. Yeah. No brainer. Right. Mm -hmm. And they said uh, they're confident that prices will drop. They just need to keep the foot on the gas pedal and get licenses awarded and out the door. Uh, and so that's really yeah, what it comes down to, right? Again, like no, no big surprise, but just access. And it has been pretty, pretty slow um, as, as far as that. So after that, um, you know, committee happened, obviously the social equity changes happened, um, but hopefully it will apply some pressure to getting uh, those licenses out the door. And so I want to talk about pricing kind of segues into that, right? And then the headline that Cureleaf was reducing production at their second growing facility. Uh, and there's arguments saying, well, you know, why are you pulling out when prices are so high, right? It's the supply and demand, right? So put more supply in, get the prices down. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, uh, I think the reality is like, there's just not enough outlets for this stuff. And like you said, with the distillate, um, I just think that there's a lot more to it than just like, okay, yeah, well then flood the market with all the product you have. It's, it's you know, people are arguing, well, you're keeping pricing yeah, maybe artificially inflated. But I just don't think that there's enough um, channel like to get the product out the door for the amount that they're producing ultimately. And even if you lowered the prices, I don't think we would see you know significantly more um, sales happening. I think you'd see some you know possibly p p pulling people in. But the fact that you know th these retail stores aren't open in a meaningful way for a, a state the size of New Jersey, like a population the size of New Jersey, I think that's where we'll really see. Uh, pricing come down less of like, well, you know, Cure Leaf can just take all their product and, and pour it in and, and drive, you know, prices down. No, I mean, I think there's, there's taking that approach and then there's distorting the market and then there's market viability. And let's face it, like this industry, because of the tax situation and the fragmentation, it's very expensive to run these businesses. And so if you absolutely decimate your gross margin profile and then your EBITDA and your path to free cash flow, you can't, it's not, it's not viable. So, so there's that. There's also the hard lessons learned by other markets. And I think you have to make these difficult choices in a time before you get totally railroaded. So in, in Massachusetts, we saw the wholesale pricing absolutely crater. We saw, we've seen this in Colorado, California, Oregon, you name it, we've seen it. It's better to get a, in business, just like in sailing, just like in anything else, it's better to get ahead of it before the catastrophe occurs. So I think you have to just be mindful of resourcing and, and getting ahead of this because there's more canopy coming online in the state. So it will, I mean, also, Pen, I mean, Pennsylvania, and that's why we've seen a wipeout of the craft growers is because there wasn't enough retail, it, it didn't convert to adult use, and there was a lot of capacity built. And so, I mean, these are the stories that people don't always hear about, because a lot of those groups were private operators, but 
Um, these are the pain points of our market when we get uh, pear-shaped on our supply and access, as, as you and I talk about, not demand, access. But um, yeah, I'd like to see the pricing come down. I mean, I went there, shopped, and uh, did have a little bit of sticker shock. I enjoy very competitive rate uh, pricing here in California before my ta- my taxes are applied. <laughs> but, you know, it's a, it's a very different world out there. And um, it is a, a market that, let's face it, has only been open for a year and three Four, four months, not even, you're in three and a half months. So it's a young market in the timeline of these, of, in the arc of a maturing market. Yeah. And they did issue or approved 138 new licenses for manufacturing or retail businesses. That's the Cannabis Regulatory Commission, but that stuff takes time, right? And mm-hmm. to, to build these up. And to, so I understand, you know, why, why this, um, this would happen with, with Cure Leaf. but yeah, hopefully these stores open up, uh, you know, more ability to process a lot of this uh, production. Uh, but until then, yeah, it, it's not that surprising. But I do want to kind of get into the New Jersey uh, stats. As far as size of the market, right. um, there, it, Q1 sales um, for this year, they did about $145 million. Uh, this mm-hmm. is state-reported data. And, uh, you know, looking kind of to com- compare and contrast, you know, Maryland, also a very new market, right, has like a month of sales. Uh, they just reported their sales uh, at 87 million in month one. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's almost double the size. Maryland's almost the double double the size of a New Jersey, and Maryland had a, a pretty robust, uh, you know, market as as we covered, you know, in previous uh, you know podcasts. Mm-hmm. And so they were able to kind of flip the switch, similar to Missouri, where okay. New Jersey is taking the tack of okay, well, you know, opening new new doors and the whole process. It was just a different, different process. So not apples to apples, but just to kind of give you a sense, like New Jersey's got a long way to go, I guess mm-hmm. is the short of it, right? <laughs> um, and then c- contrast that with the medical market. So the medical market uh, lately has been uh, completely collapsing. Um, so they're, they're reporting the year uh, before adult use sales launched, the medical program had uh, over 129,000 thir- uh, patients, so almost 130,000 patients. Now, uh, you know, as of, um, I don't know, July, uh, it's 103,000 patients. Mm-hmm. So that's a 20% decline in patients, but it gets even worse uh, because mm-hmm. medical sales during the third quarter of, of 2022 were 61 million, and that mm-hmm. fell to 34 million into mm-hmm. the first quarter of 2023. So that's a 45% decline in sales. So mm-hmm. what you have is you know, a 20% decline in patients and a 45% decline in sales. What that tells me is that a lot of these patients that are just not renewing, right? Mm-hmm. But they're, they still might be an active patient, but they're completely out of the the channel now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're maybe shopping adult use. Uh, but I think what that means is like the patient count should be more around 60,000 in the end. Mm-hmm. Like if this, if the dust settles, if that holds the, the 34 million in the first quarter of 2023 for medical, Mm-hmm. And that kind of becomes the baseline. So you're only looking at 60,000 patients. And the reason why this is is rough is there are dispensaries that are medical only. I think yes. it's a, like a handful, like a, like a dozen or something, maybe 14. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then the other, you know, 30-ish are um, kind of mm-hmm. both, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so so this is like a desperate situation for a lot of these, um, these dispensaries. And they're asking um, to really be able to to expand their operations because of these slash sales, right? So that's another kind of separate problem, uh, certainly that's going on in there. As we know, there are legitimate patients out there that you know need sure. need access, and uh, that's that's tough because I think as that continues to plummet, then people will pull out of that, you know, supporting those those groups because there's just no market for them uh, to to be viable. And in New Jersey, you can't even grow your own as a as a medical patient, which is crazy. It's a uh, it's a state where grow one plant and you can go to jail for up to five years uh, and a $25,000 fine on top of that, uh, even if you have a medical. Yeah. Brutal, right? You know, I think uh, one of the things I heard from from an operator when I was in uh, the stores was that they had been talking with one of the New Jersey regulators and the New Jersey regulators had done a tour of Colorado to kind of learn what works, what doesn't work. And one of the things they reflected on was that Colorado was like, if if it was us, we would just do away with the medical market and just convert it all over to adult use, which is kind of like what we did here in California to an extent. Although and Washington. I do, 
yeah, Washington or you know, anyway. Um, but New Jersey did try to provide some additional support for the medical patients, which I thought was great, which was a tax break for them. Um, and I know certain stores were trying to promote that because there are things that the stores are required to do. Like they have, for example, sometimes like medical only lines and section of the store that are medical so that they can get priority access and they're not standing because there are these stores can be high volume depending on where they're located. Um, opening an hour early. Opening an hour medical. early. Yeah, things like that, which I do think is a great thing because, you know, I do believe in the people who are really um, using this as like pure medical support and they do have chronic conditions that qualify. So I think it's important to not forget those groups. Um, but I think the regulators are still trying to wrap their arms around it. And importantly, you don't want to set operators up to fail because the market is um, declining and yet the state is requiring certain things around it and then it limits other uh, growth opportunities. So, which then in turn can cyclically hurt the medical uh, patients because the market is struggling. So um, New Jersey does seem to be thriving and, you know, I'm, I did uh, check out some sites where I think the stores will be opening and when you do see, um, to your point, the communities that do not have programs for adult use or any cannabis programs, um, some of these doors that'll be opening should do really interesting revenue profiles. And don't forget, there is the border state to uh, Pennsylvania here, and um, they don't have adult use yet. So that's interesting. Yeah, it is. And uh, I mean, is it 40, 45 stores uh, that, are, that are open out there? So, and they did what, 145 million in sales uh, mm -hmm. in Q1. So mm -hmm. that's 3 million a store, um, you know, on average. It's mm -hmm. pretty good volume for the, the small amount. So I think there's there's plenty of room yet for more retailers to, to come in. You know, mm -hmm. that'll obviously, you know, like we said, change the pricing dynamic, hopefully open up opportunity for some of these new licenses that are going to the, the revised kind of social equity uh, structure here for mm -hmm. delivery and, and so on. So I think all in all, these changes are good, um, you know, and it, and it's always nice to hear just iterating, you know, the markets mm -hmm. aren't just like, hey, we, we, we checked the box, we built the program, we're yeah. moving on. Uh, but, you know, to have the Cannabis Regulatory Committee kind of being held to task by their Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, I think is good. And I think, you know, some of these these changes are certainly good. And, and you're, you're right, like they're surrounded, you know, New Jersey right now, I think from a adult use perspective, is okay because you got New York, which, you yeah. know, is the, the slowest rollout of all time. Oh and, you know, well, I mean, apart from the illicit market, um, but the legal channels limited Pennsylvania, uh, medical still. Right. And so I think, you know, those are, you know, direct borders, right. It takes a little bit yeah. more to get to Maryland. You could, uh, it's not that far We're rolling through Delaware, but, uh, you know, yeah. yeah. So, but yeah. I think once, if Pennsylvania ever goes adult use or New York eventually gets its feet under itself, that'll really, uh, force the, the issue on New Jersey. It'll start to look like an outlier. Yeah. And I mean, I think you just have to look at Illinois and where it's settled in with Missouri opening next door, because that was a big source of over border traffic into these retailers and in certain regions of the state. And it, I think it's settling in and, and Illinois is another market. And we talked about a couple of weeks ago that needs to get more doors open. New Jersey needs to get more doors open. By the way, do you know the total revenue through the legal channel in New York through first half of 2023? This number is just... I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I do. Uh, let's hear it. <laughs> it's 33 million. 33 million. The state of New York. I mean, that's year to date. That's through first half 2023. Yeah. Staggering on, yeah. on a, on the disappointing end. Anyway, <laughs> New Jersey's benefiting. I, you know, another thing that's really interesting, this is what I love about being able to go to markets is like, you know, you can do everything you want remotely, but there's nothing like being in person. And so, you know, New Jersey, especially Northern Jersey, is a very heavily trafficked uh, state, literally cars everywhere and, ev and these major thoroughfares and huge stretches of strip malls and car dealerships <laughs> and the bada bang. But, um, you know, it's like when you look on a map, you think, OK, this store is three miles from another store. Uh Oh, they're going to have a competitive issue. But I got to tell you, I realized in just driving around and, and kind of, I knew this intuitively just because I do know New Jersey a bit, but driving from one township to another over a three mile distance 
it's a world of difference because of the traffic and because of just the way that the different towns are laid out. And um, I just think it's it's a really interesting experiment in moats around retail and and when a store opens, what it really means. And in New Jersey, I mean, honest to God, you could have something on Route 22 across from across the street. But because it's like a divided highway with cars going in one direction versus another. And in New Jersey, you have these things called like jug handles to turn around <laughs> or, or to exit. But, um, you know, it's like that could mean the difference in terms of who's coming to your store. So it's just a really interesting experience to dig in on these things. And, and in traditional retail, you would investigate that. And so we do so in cannabis, too. But I'm excited for New Jersey. I'm excited for Maryland and hope for the best for New York. Yeah, yeah. And uh, as New Jersey opens up these stores, maybe the stores won't be as busy and we have uh, some potential for a clerk's like situation where some <laughs> some bud tenders in a dispensary can just talk uh, philosophy all day instead of serving the the line of uh, customers there. But as we as we close out, I do want to mention uh, we did launch a high rise website and encourage everyone to check it out. Uh, we are posting content. So like the the stuff that we're talking about here, we're also creating content around that. So if you want to kind of follow along um, or just see what we're talking about or maybe you didn't catch an episode, uh, it'll all be published there. Uh, more to come. So take a look and um, be sure to if you, you know, enjoying this, obviously, give us a rating uh, and a review. Uh, really helpful on there. And uh, those will be published on the website as well. But as always, thanks for listening. And we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for listening to the High Rise Podcast presented by Headset. For more information on Headset, visit headset.io.